Thank you. No, thank you very much, everyone. It's uh, pretty cool to be here. I've only ever done this talk online because of the last two years, so um, it's actually good to see faces uh, for the first time. Um, so yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about the uh, Mayflower Autonomous Ship. Um, it's a really cool project that's been going on for about two years now. Oh, actually, it's been going on for way longer, but two years just for me. Um, and it's a collaboration between IBM and an organization called Primare. Um, so just get that out of the way. Um, I'm just here because I think it's really cool and I think people might want to know about it. Um, so all of my opinions are my own, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just quickly about me. So maker, IoT enthusiast. I worked a lot on the Eclipse projects for uh, the MQTT Paho clients. Um, I work for IBM Research. So there's this amazing house down near Winchester in Southampton called IBM Hursley. It's one of the biggest software labs in the UK for IBM. And it's basically where our IBM research team works to solve problems for people where there aren't solutions yet. So typically people will come to us going, I've got this problem, everyone says it can't be done, can't find an off-the-shelf solution for it. And we go, ah, we'll do it. And we usually figure out a way somehow. And that's usually by reaching into some of the really cool work that our colleagues in research have done and bringing it into sort of the real world. Um, as part of that, I work at Wimbledon. IBM have got a 30-year plus partnership with the, the tournament there, so we tend to do all of the uh, statistics and t uh, stats capture, getting it out to the website, your TV graphics, and all that kind of cool stuff. Um, and then finally, the Mayflower Autonomous Ship, which has pretty much taken up most of my time for the last two years. Um, so what is this thing? It's a fully autonomous, crewless, full-size ship capable of independently traversing oceans, which is a really, really important thing. Um, the, the background from where this came about was about five, six years ago, uh, Plymouth Town Council were looking for a way to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the original Mayflower, making its way from Plymouth in the UK to Plymouth in the United States with those, the, the, the pilgrims. Um, and they were thinking, oh, you know, maybe we'll just uh, build a replica or something. And there's this guy in the room uh, called Brett who owns a, sh a company that makes submarines, which I, it's just such a cool, cool thing. And he went, no, 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 we don't do that. We're going to make a ship that's looking forward to the next 400 years. We're going to look at the future of marine uh, technology, at autonomy, and, you know, really try and do some good in the world, some, you know, ocean science and things like that as well. So it's kind of broken into these two parts. You've got the AI captain, which um, has been done by a company called Marine AI and IBM Automation. And that's sort of making a ship that can, you know, completely with a human on the loop, but not in the loop, uh, get from one side of the ocean to the other. And then the other part of that is the science payload. So we've got to have a reason for crossing oceans. And that, in this case, it's to do really important ocean research. So we've got loads of experiments and sensors packed on board. And being able to do all of that science without any humans in the loop is a, a really important thing too. Um, so you can see here, is the, this is the Mayflower. This was when it was uh, off on its uh, first voyage. Um, it's a 15 meter long trimaran, about six meters wide. Can travel at about up to six or seven knots at full speed. Um, and it's, I, I think it looks great. It was, they, the, the, the designer was a bit of a fan of uh, Star Trek. So if you get the sort of spaceship feel, that's, that's where that's from. Um, it's aluminium, so really lightweight. Um, and it's got a really cool hybrid electric drive system. So it can use its solar panels and its batteries during the day, but then it's got a biodiesel generator that it uses when it's in rough waters and at nighttime and things like that. Um, and for navigation, it's got uh, AIS, radar, uh, GNSS, and it's got six cameras mounted on its mast to give it a really good view of the world around it so that it can pick out obstacles in its way, identify them, and then move around them. Um, this is all done with the AI captain, which I'll get into in a little bit, but I'll just give you a little idea of what we've actually done so far. So this isn't actually our first time across the Atlantic. It's out there now in, in the, uh, the sea. You can see on the map, it's sort of on its way up to Halifax. This is sort of uh, version 2.5 of, of the journey. Originally, we were going to be going from Plymouth in the UK to Plymouth in the US. Uh, slightly changed to Washington, because we had some events that we wanted to get it down there for. And then, unfortunately, we had a, a few little um, technical glitches along the way. Uh, where we had to take a little diversion to the Azores. I think the team just wanted a holiday for a couple of days, but uh, that's <laughs> we'll, we'll never know. Um, so they had to go down and, and change something uh, in the, the charging circuit. And then it's on its way up. And then we diverted to Halifax because um, just for a number of reasons, uh, it's been quite a long way. We want to get it to land quite soon. There's an experiment that we'll really appreciate being in that particular part of the ocean, which I'll get to later. Um, and there's some really rough seas coming up. I mean, we've got rough winds here, but it's getting pretty rough out in the, uh, the, the Atlantic for the, for the Mayflower as well. Um, so that's where I was this morning when I had these slides prepared. And then I get this uh, WhatsApp from a colleague. And, oh, 
why does something have to keep happening? Um, it turns out there was a ship on its way to meet it. Uh, this is the um, Endeavour, which is an American research vessel, um, which was, was going out to meet it. And then suddenly we're just watching on the, on the webcams, uh, and suddenly they come right up to it, they hook on, uh, and um, they, they start escorting it. And as it turns out, this was completely intentional. Basically, uh, it's gotten so far into the journey where the sea state is just too rough for it. Uh, and they were there anyway, so they thought, well, why not? Let's just escort it all the way back to port. So that's, that's kind of where it is at the moment. Um, if you've been following, for everyone else who's not been following, um, head to maz400.com and you'll get all of the details there. Um, so I speak about this AI captain. I'll, I'll go over that really briefly. Having a way of autonomously navigating the ocean is really important. Um, at the moment, you've got to have really, a really highly trained crew who can do that. Uh, and if you've watched the talk last night about the oil rig, you'll know that having a really good uh, uh, sort of autonomous system is, is really important, especially when it's turned on or off. Um, and for, for this, we really wanted to prove out all of the different steps of technology to make something that was really, really safe and um, reliable. So the AI captain is built up of a number of different steps. So we've got our sort of data fusion layer, which takes the camera footage. So we're using um, a machine learning model that's been trained on millions of images of pretty much anything you could find at sea and stuff you wouldn't expect as well. So, um, you know, pictures of tankers, oil rigs, not that we should find any out there. Uh, flotsam and jetsam, you know, it's quite a lot of rubbish out in the ocean and we don't want to bump into that. Um, as well as paddle borders, because around Plymouth where we've been training it, people just like to sort of float out into the Plymouth Sound and, and get in the way of us. So we've got all of that image data, which we can, we can analyze. We've got AIS, so we know what ships are reporting to be around us, which is really important. Um, and then we've got radar as well. And we need radar and camera footage as well, because not every ship follows the rules and broadcasts their location, especially fishermen. They like to hide where they are when they're um, getting their fish. So we've got to rely on radar and cameras as well to, to know exactly what's out there. So once we fused all of that data together, we also take a feed from the, the weather company so we know what the sea state's likely to be like in the future. Um, and we then put that into sort of the, the, the main part of the AI captain, which is basically a, a really, really sophisticated rules engine. It's a piece of IBM technology called ODM. And it usually is being used to you know, decide whether someone can afford a mortgage or something. And they flipped it on, their, on, on its head and they taught it what's called the coal regs, which is basically the rules of the road for the sea. So when you learn to drive a car, you know exactly how you should be driving. Um, there's the same set of rules for if you are at sea, saying, you know, how do you pass other vessels at sea? What happens if you're heading towards each other? You know, do you go to starboard or to port? Whose responsibility is that? It depends on the type of vessel as well. So we taught it all of those rules really about how to behave when it sees other vessels. It's then got a second system which has been trained on something called SOLAS, which is safety of life at sea. And that's another set of rules which sort of, it's kind of like what a really wise captain would do. And it allows you to sort of have a bit more autonomy around the, the gray areas of, you know, what happens when you're expecting to do something and the other vessel should go to starboard but doesn't. How do you re respond to that? How do you do it in a safe way? As I said, safety of life at sea, that's the main priority. We're an autonomous vessel, so our priority is to basically stay away from any other ships as much as we can. Once it's been through that whole system, it's been optimized, we've worked out exactly where we are and where we're going, the outcome of that is a heading and a speed. And that's basically how the ship operates. It's just continually going like that. So that's the AO captain. But what are we going to do with the ship? So I mentioned we're doing lots of science. If you look at the, the cutaway of this ship, there's actually a really small bit in the middle you can just about see. It's about three meter long by one meter by one meter void, and that's our science payload bay. Now, if you were to look at a real big research vessel like the RSS David Attenborough or the James Cook, they're massive, they're hugely expensive, you know, in the hundreds of millions. They're crewed by a hugely capable crew. You've got all the scientists on board as well doing huge amounts of work, and that's really important at sea. But when you've got smaller experiments, that have to go out into sort of difficult spots of, la uh, spots of sea, sorry, um, or spend maybe really, really long times out there. You don't want to force a crew or a load of scientists to go out at sea for long periods of time. Sea is really dangerous. Unless you really need to be out in, in the Atlantic, you really don't want to go there. And so reducing the risk to human life and also improving the comfort to those humans is a really, really important you know, 
sort of benefit. As well as it comes down to cost. You know, these big research vessels that we have are massive. They cost a huge amount of money to run. And you really want to prioritize them for the science they, they're best suited for rather than sending them out to sort of very uh, remote areas and wasting large amounts of money fueling them up and sending them out for long periods of time. So if you've got a small ship that's autonomous and you can aut automate the science on board, that's perfect. You just send it out to where it needs to go, it goes along, captures the data, comes back. You could have a small fleet of these. They could go out to all kinds of places. They could all link together and, and track data that way. So that's kind of where we're going with this. That's the, the, the whole um, ethos of why we're trying to condense uh, all the science down and automate it. So I'll give you a quick summary now of all of the different experiments that we've got on board. And these are being done usually with IBM and then a number of partner universities around the UK on board. Um, so for instance, here we go, we've got a whale population uh, experiment. So tracking whales is notoriously quite difficult. They're never where you expect them to be. And uh, you know, tracking them down can be quite difficult. So we wanted in a way sort of almost passively monitoring them. You know, if you could put a system on a ship and that ship just happened to be passing you know, in a particular area and you were able to hear those whales, you'd be able to say, ah, right, I've heard some right whales uh, and they're over here. But how do you know what kind of you know, whale they are actually or what kind of marine mammal are they or even what kind of marine creature making noise are they? Um, so th this is where a lot of the work we've been doing is it's taking a hydrophone mounted on the underside of the ship and we've trained it with uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours of already recorded um, whale song and dolphin noises and all kinds of other things. And we're building up a massive machine learning model that can autonomously basically go, ah, yeah, that's a right whale, I heard that. And we can clip out that audio and send it off to the research team in Plymouth and a number of other places like the Jupiter Foundation. Um, so this has been a really interesting one because putting a hydrophone on the underside of a ship uh, doesn't work particularly well, especially when the ship is blasting along at seven knots, because uh, you tend to hear basically the sound of you getting dragged underwater. So uh, we've been doing a huge amount of work on filtering out that ambient noise of the, uh, the, the, the water being dragged along the underside of the ship. And we think we're making pretty good progress there. We're hoping we should have about a terabyte's worth of data by the end of our current voyage from the UK to, to um, the Americas at the moment, uh, which should be available in a, the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Uh, and actually, this is from our voyage last year, so hopefully you can just see some dolphins um, just sort of on the, the, the port side of the ship, just coming through the water there. I don't know how clear that is for you. But this was, this was really a, a nice thing to see because they sort of attracted to, to ships generally, and so we were just out there, or it was on that, out there on its own, and they just sort of, they came come up a side and uh, follow us along for a while. And we saw this happen again on our voyage uh, this time round too, which is really nice. So um, hopefully we'll get some, some good footage of those as well. And then also the audio of them. If we can get the audio of them making their um, vocalizations underwater as well as uh, seeing them above water, I think that'll be, be quite special. Uh, so another experiment, so this is ocean chemistry. And this is uh, a, a really cool one because it's a, a, a really nice reuse of technology. So IBM Research in Zurich came up with this thing called Hypertaste. It's a digital tongue. So you can tr train it to detect uh, the chemical sort of uh, fingerprint of liquid. So typically being used to identify, you know, is this a real Scotch whiskey or, you know, is it maybe a faked perfume or something. And with the help of Plymouth University, they flipped it on its head a little bit and now have built this really awesome pumping mechanism that's on the Mayflower Tongue of the ship itself. And that is basically tasting the seawater every 15 minutes. And it's looking for the concentrations of dissolved carbonates in the seawater. Um, now, they help us understand the rate of ocean acidification in different parts of the ocean. So we're hoping that as we've passed along, and we've actually done sort of a nice sort of up and down and then back up motion across the Atlantic, we might get some interesting differences in the data to track how and where and what rate the ocean is sort of getting acidified, which is all related to, to, to uh, climate change. Um, this was really a difficult one because typically uh, you can see the, the actual sensor itself is, you know, in, in that picture there, it's sitting on a nice glass of water. So building this into a system where you can automatically, you know, uh, suck water out of the ocean, put all of the different uh, testing fluids through and the cleaning fluids through, required quite a lot of work. It was basically one uh, student's PhD to sit there and build this entire pumping mechanism and build all of the complex steps so that if it got itself into a confusing state, it could sort itself back out and just carry on on its own. Um, all of that data is then passed through another machine learning model, which will hopefully give us all of the data. Um, We've got our open ocean wave energy experiment. So this is really cool. So this is looking at 
If you have video footage of waves coming at you, so in this case we're, you know, waves coming at the ship, and you've got a really good inertial measurement unit in the ship, which is like an accelerometer on your phone, so it knows how the ship's behaving in the water, can you match up the wave crashing into the bow of the ship with then the ship lifting up and going over it? Because if you can do that, you know the weight, size, and dynamics of the ship itself. You know how much energy was in that wave that just crashed into you, which is really important for, say, looking at you know predicting the amount of damage that coastal infrastructure might take. If you're looking at you know how fast is this cliff going to degrade, or maybe this oil rig, how much damage that's going to take, or even maybe if you're looking to put a tidal energy harvesting system somewhere, you know working out where's the best spot along a coastline to do that. Um, so this is all uh, data collection at the moment, we're just collecting that data and then the team in Liverpool are going to be um, looking through this data and hopefully starting to build that machine learning model for future uh, voyages. Um, and then we've got our open ocean tides and sea level one. This is something that I never considered until I heard it. So obviously it's really easy to measure the tides around the UK or any coastline. You have a big stick, you put it in the water and you see the water go up and down, you can measure how high the tide is. And we've got really good models on the coast to know exactly, you know, at X o'clock it's going to be three metre high tide. In the open ocean, it's a little bit different. The, the, moon, the gravity from the moon will suck the water up on the ocean, so it is much higher in places and much lower in other places, but there isn't a very easy way to measure that. And a lot of the GNSS navigation systems, because you're rocking around on the ocean quite a lot, don't give you a very accurate reading of meters above theoretical sea level with the, the model that the Earth is that we have. So this is using, uh, actually, it's, some off-the-shelf um, GNSS receivers that you can get if you want to do uh, real-time kinematics. These things are great. Plugged into a Raspberry Pi, and they're sitting there, and they're measuring the really accurate um, readings between each other, and then they will be compared. So they're actually mounted uh, on the uh, sort of near the uh, front of the, the, the Mayflower, and then sort of off to the side as well. So we've got a nice sort of triangle pattern, and they'll be used to track how the ship is in the water, and then also the height of it as well. Um, and this is just you know really useful data to be collecting about our Earth. You know, I'm sure most of us have all heard the, the phrase of you know we know more about space around the Earth than we do the oceans, uh, and this is you know it's one of those things we're trying to understand. So those are just some of the experiments we've got on the, on the ship at the moment. We've also got a host of other sort of what we call wet sensors, so things like a, a CTD fluorometer, uh, oxygen sensors, temperature sensors, and they're all mounted on the underside of the ship measuring the water. Uh, we've got a depth sensor as well. Um, we didn't quite read the documentation on that, so that worked, that's been working absolutely perfectly, but we panicked because the data feed we get uh, was going great, great, great. We're getting all these numbers. We're going, oh, brilliant. We know how low the surface of the, uh, the sea floor is underneath the Mayflower. And then it just went to zero. And we went, hmm, that's a bit odd. And after a while, we realized it's because the Mayflower had gone over the continental shelf and uh, we'd reached our maximum rating on the depth sensor. So the depth sensor was working absolutely fine, uh, but <laughs> we, just, we just didn't realize that zero meant in, or too far, not too low. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of fun. Um, so how are we doing all of this? Uh, some of these, you know, as you can see, it's a Raspberry Pi in a box, um, or it's a hydrophone. Uh, but a lot of it's using, you know, we're trying to use machine learning for some of these experiments. We're trying to store all the data. We're trying to monitor it. We're trying to optimize when it runs as well. So we had to look around building uh, what we call sort of our science at the edge box or our science pod, um, which we started basically in June 2020 uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, we didn't have much to go on. We had to sort of scrounge around what we could, uh, ordering stuff offline, off the internet, trying to get things together. Um, and we basically ended up with this, which is a suitcase full of Raspberry Pis, um, which I'm actually quite proud of, even though it does look very messy on the inside. So we've got four Raspberry Pi 4Bs. Uh, we've got a little small mini UPS, uh, a little switch, uh, about 12 terabytes worth of SSD storage. Uh, and then we've got our, our hydrophone receiver and our, our IMU in there and stuff. And that's basically all mounted inside a Peli case uh, and it sits inside the Mayflower. Actually, you know, it's really tiny. It takes up about that much space, which we had to make sure of because some of the other experiments like Hypertase are much, much bigger. Um, the, the brief we were given was basically, it's going to get knocked around. We're probably going to stand on it. It might get wet. So try and make something that's going to survive all that. And that's kind of where we ended up with, with the sort of, you know, bunch of wires and stuff in a Peli case. Um, you can see, I don't know whether that's too, too clear on there, but um, you, you can see a sort of rough system diagram of how we, how we built everything. Uh, the, the rough idea of this was that 
uh, we were told, you know, if there was something would go wrong, which, you know, in, in, in cases it did, they would cut power to us. The ship had to make sure that at all times the AI captain uh, was the thing in charge. And if they were going, oh, we've got to, you know, start shutting systems off, we were probably one of the first to go. And that's fair enough. You've got to, you've got to maintain the safety of the ship. So we had to make sure that when we got that, hey, you're being turned off signal, we could safely shut down all of the experiments, close all of the files, make sure all of that was saved away nicely, and then sit there and safely shut the whole system down. Um, but sometimes we just wouldn't get that at all. So that's why we have this tiny little UPS there. It's not to keep us running for hours and hours. It gives us about 20 minutes to shut the whole pod down and put ourselves into a nice safe state. Uh, we learned a lot about Raspberry Pis during this, including how to build watchdogs to watch the Raspberry Pis, which are watching each other to make sure that if you get yourself into a bit of a weird power state, it all still carries on and you, know, you, can, you can start the whole thing up again. Um, but the great thing about this was that you know, we get these data feeds. We've got um, most of the compute work is happening in that box. We're doing all of the machine learning, running all of our models, saving all of the data. And we get a very, very small bit of uh, satellite bandwidth to send back the status of how all of this stuff is going. So what you're looking at here is just a, an update on you know, it's the status of the experiments. It's the temperature on the inside the pod. It's a little bit warm. It's fine. Um, the CPUs, how they're going. And you can see there in the uh, top left, some of our experiments go from on to off quite a lot. And it was something we realized halfway through. We were recording loads of camera footage. And uh, then we realized, well, when it's dark, you can't see very much at all. You can see a perfect picture of the ship because it shows up lovely in the infrared, but you can't see any of the waves. You can't see anything about it. So you know, looking at turning off some experiments when you don't need them, really important, save data. Looking at where you are as well. We're traveling across the Atlantic, which means we're slowly passing through all of those time zones. So we're using the location of the ship to work out, you know, where are we? When does the sun rise? When does it set? Let's use that as a, as a basis for all of this, this kind of stuff. Um, it's all built pretty much on open source. Um, there's some, you know, the experiments themselves will be running on code written by the universities and IBM, but everything supporting this box is basically Node Red, got Python, Grafana, InfluxDB, uh, running on Raspberry Pis. Um, and we've, you know, a lot of the, st the stuff we've done, we're sort of looking at open sourcing and, and, and giving back, you know, in some of the Node Red nodes that we've had to build for this. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those great things where you can, whilst you're sitting on a very cold dock in Plymouth on a February day and they go, hey, we're going to change where this sensor is, you can just drag a node across the screen and boom, it's gone. If you've not tried Node Red, it's fantastic. Give it a go. Um, so I just, I'll sort of finish off. We've got about eight minutes left to talk about data feeds. So as I mentioned, we've got all of these open data feeds. The ship is um, out there in the Atlantic. It's got SATCOM. We're feeding that back to an MQTT server, which is open for anybody to access. It's at mqtt.mas400.com. And on that, you can get all kinds of stuff. You can see the status of the ship itself, so where it is, how fast it's going, what direction it's heading in, how some of the uh, solar panels are performing, the batteries and all that kind of stuff. You can look at the science experiments, see what's running, when it's running, how it's running, uh, see the health of, health of all the sort of the experiments and the, the, the pod itself as well. Um, and it's, as I said, it's open for anybody to access to. So there's a documentation page that you can go to uh, where we've listed exactly how all of this stuff works. Um, and We've, you know, quite a few people have started building stuff over the past couple of months. So we've got some, you know, really great models. So if you look on the top, it's a small Mayflower on a uh, turntable that will always point in the direction that the actual ship's going, and it lights up in, in that respect. We've got a Twitter bot which is uh, reporting uh, where where it is and its progress from the UK to the US. Uh, people have built maps for it and all kinds of things, um, and you can. You know, it, it, you could probably get from nothing to something in about 20 minutes. We should have probably done a workshop on this, but we didn't didn't quite have time. Um, so, overall, I'd say this has been about two years worth of work. Where are we going to go next? The ship's going to get to the US in the next couple of days, probably. Uh, it's going to get to Canada because Halifax. Um, Whilst we're going through, we're going to be listening to all of the whales, uh, hopefully because lots of right whales up there, and then we'll be getting to Halifax, and we'll be offloading all of the, uh, the rich data feeds as well. So we've got all of the lights of light data feeds. Uh, the rich data feeds will be coming soon after, so that'll be all of the video, all of the sensor data from the um, uh, wet sensors on the underside of the ship. That will all be open. 
we're going to make sure that everybody can get access to that. So if you want to look at, you know, plotting the temperature of the seawater across the Atlantic Ocean, you can do that. If you want to look at the oxygen concentration, you can do that. And then once all of the uh, research teams have found their results and things like that, they will all be uh, put open as well. Um, you can also uh, go to maz400.com, which I think I mentioned, and watch all of the live web webcams. So you can just literally see what's happening with the ship see how it's getting on uh, and what it's doing. And uh, currently, there's a sort of another ship hanging in front of it ominously as they slowly get towards Halifax. So looking a bit further into the future, it's going to spend some time uh, probably going up and down the US coast. Uh, we'll still be capturing data as we're there. Um, and we'll be popping into quite a few ports along the way to let people go and see it. So if you happen to be on the east coast of the US in the next 12 months, um, you might even be able to you know, go and see the ship itself, which would be quite cool. And then looking even for, further future, um, we're looking at, you know, there's going to be different versions of these boats uh, potentially in the ocean doing different things. So maybe there will be a specific boat that will be doing a particular job, maybe doing, uh, replacing a role that we, you know, we currently have ships that will go out to certain uh, science boys every single week or month to uh, corroborate the data that those science boys are collecting. We can automate that and do it in a ship. Um, what I'd love to see is having a fleet of ships. Uh, I think having a, a whole fleet of these uh, ships going out and coordinating amongst each other um, to capture data, especially if you're trying to do triangulation, say if you're trying to look for whales and things like that, you've got one audio source, that's not quite enough. You know, Maybe you can do it with, uh, with more. Um, so that's, that's probably sort of uh, the, where the, 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 the near future of, of this is going to be. Um, but generally, we're trying to be as open as possible about it. I think the, the last word that I got, which was literally on WhatsApp about half an hour ago, uh, was uh, because of the weather out there, it's, it's on its route to Halifax. And yeah, they've, it, it's, it's been fantastic. To give you an idea of how this has been running, uh, we have a team who are working down in Plymouth who have been watching all of the same data feeds that you or I do. So uh, if you go you know, look at the, the webcams, you can see all of that stuff. And they're sitting there watching it, maybe with a bit more data, and they can see the ship on its way up there. But they've had someone sat there for 24 hours a day for the last month or so, uh, since about 27th of April, just keeping an eye on it and making sure that everything's OK, um, which has been you know, quite a tough job for them. And they've, they've been doing you know, even over weekends and bank holidays and stuff like that. Um, so I think they're all looking forward to having a, a good rest, which is definitely well deserved. Um, so I think I'm actually a little bit early, but I think is that okay? That's fine. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I've, this is a lot of people, so uh, I'm really happy that everyone was, was interested in hearing about this. I'm around for the rest of the weekend, so if you want to ask questions, you want to do something, uh, come and ask me. Um, if you want to know exactly where the, how, where the ship is in its progress and you've got a decked phone, you can find out by calling 555-4014. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, why not? Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>